Hey guys, Jeremy here. Welcome back to the channel. On today's video, I'm going to show you about the worst real estate deal that I've ever done. I'm going to show you how I gave too much away to my client and how I didn't keep enough for myself. I'm going to walk you through the lessons learned on this deal and how I've been doing things differently since this deal. On the bright side, while working with this client, I was able to buy house number 36 and I also met a great realtor and broker who have encouraged me to get my real estate license, which I'm working on, and they've invited me to work with them on a very attractive split. And this will help me to save the 3% when I buy and when I sell properties. Oh, hey, it would really help the channel if you'd be so kind as to hit the like button and click the free subscribe button if you enjoy this type of content. So I was working with this client about a year ago. He came and looked at one of my properties for rent, but he was really interested in a lease option or a lease purchase. And I said, hey, I'm really not interested in selling this property. I really like to keep this one long term. And I've suspended my lease option program for my existing portfolio of property. But if you have 20% or more down, then I am still doing my lease purchase program where we can go shop for a house together buy one and then I will do a lease purchase to you for five or ten years or really as long as you need until you can get a loan in your own name and then I'll sell it to you. What I liked about this client is he had a decent amount of down payment. He had about 60 or 65 thousand that he could put down and so that was actually more than the 20 percent. That down payment is non-refundable so this deal would be very secure if he were to not close on the deal. I sent him to my website where I show some details about the lease purchase program. I've tried to make it as simple as possible so that people can understand it. So this program is great for people who can't qualify for a loan right now, but they have money they could put down on a house and they don't want to live in an apartment or some rental house. They'd like to start earning equity now. I tell those people, wouldn't you rather share in making something in a partnership deal versus earning all of nothing on your own? So we signed a letter of intent that outlined that, hey, we were going to go shop for a house together. He was going to put down some money. His monthly payments would be X and his purchase price on the tail end would be Y. And that Y is only a 2.99% annual appreciation. More on that later. Obviously, this was a super skinny deal for me. And what happened throughout the process, he kept asking for a lower monthly price, which I kept shaving off and shaving off. And I also shaved down that annual appreciation. This was first quarter of 2021. And we had already seen real estate prices starting to go up, but we really didn't realize the whole magnitude of that until a little later. And so I was putting in there 2.99% thinking that we would share if real estate generally went up about 5% a year and we halved that that I would just keep 2.99% and he would make anything above that, which he certainly did. I knew this client. I had actually bought some advertising from him for one of our other businesses. So we agreed on what kind of property he was looking for. And I helped to kind of coach him on like, hey, I really don't like this, this, and this kind of property. Because if I get stuck with it, I want a property that works for me in my portfolio. So I had him set up a Zillow search on the criteria that he's looking for so that he would get automatic updates. And so I asked him when he sees houses that he's interested in to contact the listing agent and schedule a showing. Contact that listing agent so they'll be twice as motivated to sell it to us as they would another buyer. And then once he sees something that he wants to put an offer on, call me and I'll look at it a second time with him and then make that offer. And before I make any offers, he's required to put down his deposit with me. All right, so we looked at a few houses. I think we put a couple of offers on some properties and lost them. And then finally we got to this house. The showing was like a circus. There were so many people there, so many realtors there. You didn't know who was showing the house right now. It, all the doors were just wide open. It was nuts. People were pretty defensive about wanting to get this property themselves. Himself, they didn't look friendly. There were other investors there. There were other realtors there who were interested in investing. It was nuts. There quickly became multiple offers on this property immediately. So we had to drop the inspection contingency and we were paying all cash. So we went all the way up and paid a little over asking at 215,000. This was only about $77 a square foot, which is a pretty good deal around here. Now in touring this property, I think I was the only person that noticed these termite tunnels down in a workshop underneath the crawl space. And so for that reason, I left the termite my inspection in my offer. So our all cash offer at 215 gets accepted. Of course, it's got no financing contingencies and no inspection contingencies and so on. We get the termite inspector there and guess what? They find active termites. The realtor asks the owners they will pay to have the termites treated and the owner says, no, it'll be cheaper for me just to deny their offer and accept the next highest bid. The realtor and I were just shocked. We had neither seen this before. Usually if somebody has active termites on their property, they take care of that problem. You know, if they're there's a loan on it, the bank will not let that transaction happen unless they're treated. When you're paying on cash, there's not someone looking out for you like that. So we were shocked that the owners wouldn't take care of their termites. So we get the house treated for termites and then go to closing. Everything goes smoothly. My tenant takes possession the day of closing and starts paying rent. He's responsible for 100% of the maintenance 
maintenance and upkeep. He's also responsible for the yard, the utilities, and all those things. So one of the mistakes I made here, I never add any type of restrictions. I try to add almost little to no restrictions in my contracts. I try to make them very simple like I would want myself. So for example, I don't require any minimum length of time for somebody to stay in the house before they can buy the property so I can make more money. Historically, my tenants have stayed in properties five or maybe close to 10 years in my other lease purchase deal before they get their credit right or before they get qualified for a loan. So after only a few months, my tenant contacts me and says, hey, I think I'm getting close to being ready to qualify for a loan. And I say, oh, okay. So he asks for a payoff. He does this a few times, actually. Eventually, he adds a family member onto our agreement so that they could co-sign on a loan for him to help him qualify for a loan sooner. So I agree to that, no problem. The lender was a little unusual in that they would not allow him to pay any closing costs. Per our agreement, of course, he was required to pay the closing costs on both ends of the deal. And in order for this deal to work, I agreed to take the closing costs and add them to the price of the property and then, you know, quote, pay all of his closing costs for him to make the deal work. Obviously, that would increase my capital gains or profit on this deal. So I multiplied that increase in my profit times my average tax rate and added that to the increase in the price as well. That way, it's not costing me anything. So after the bank and title company had all the paperwork ready and final, we actually closed on this property just shy of a year, which means I'm also going to get short-term capital gains, which is my effective tax rate instead of the more beneficial long-term capital gain. I didn't want to bother asking the guy to take it another week because he was such in a hurry to get this thing closed and wanted to lock in and he didn't want his rate lock to expire. Okay, so let's look at the numbers. So we bought it here in March for $215,000 or about $80 a square. We had closing costs, termite treatment, and then after a few months, I financed it. Again, most of my clients take several years and so I want to free my money up so I can buy something else. And in our agreement, he was responsible for paying all closing costs, including financing costs. My clients benefit when I use my cash to go buy them so we can win the deals and get them cheaper than other people with financing contingency. So at this point, I've got 220,000 in the property minus the 60,000 down payment that he gives me that's non-refundable by the way. So I've got $160,000 invested in this property. So then here's the problem. Just a few days shy of one year, he wants to cash out and buy the property. And per our agreement, I only make 2.99% of the amount that I have invested, not actually the entire purchase price. Everything in my agreement incentivizes him to put more money down. And that lowers his monthly payment. And that also lowers the appreciation side that I keep. I'll double click here and you can see my formula. So I'm basically getting 2.99% or 3% times the 160,000 that I've got invested. And so I only made $4,800 in this deal. This is certainly not a good use of my time. I should not be doing deals where I make less than $10,000. And usually these kind of deals net me a lot more than that because people take several years to buy them. So the buyer's purchase price on the tail end of this is going to be the 215 that we paid for it plus my 3% increase, as you can see in the formula. So that's 219.8 is what his purchase price is. So that's only $81 a square. His appraisal came in at 290,000, which is 107 a square. So if I subtract the 219 purchase price from the 290, he's making a $70,000 equity position in this property in just one year. And I'm making $4,800. He contacted me when he got that appraisal back and he was actually disappointed. He said, hey, my neighbor's house sold for 328,000 and it's a little under the square footage, but he says his house is a whole lot nicer. So this house immediately next door sold for 123 a square. So if we take $123 a square foot and multiply it by his square footage, that means his house will be worth 331,000, in which case he would have 111,000 of equity. Have I mentioned I made only $4,800 on this property? If you know who calls this stupid tax, put a comment below. Now, if I use the average per square foot that I've been getting from Redfin and Zillow recently on sales in this neighborhood, which are even more recent than the neighbor's house selling, you can see that they've averaged $166 a square and $72 a square foot was the latest one. If you multiply the square footage of this property by $166 a square, this house will be worth $448,000, in which case my client would have $228,000 in equity. Did I mention how much I made on this house? So if my take wasn't bad enough, we actually closed on the sixth day of the month and I did make a typo on one of the documents that I sent to the title company. So the client actually owed five or six days of rent because we closed on the sixth day of the month. And so that's a couple hundred dollars or so. But the client asked me to give him a credit for those few days and not charge him rent since the closing got moved and it was my fault. I had to breathe through that one a minute and I actually waited to send that response to him because he's a super nice guy. You know, he always treats people well and does the right thing. And he probably just didn't realize that this deal is incredibly fantastic for him. Not so great at all for me. <laughs> As of the filming of this video, he has not paid that balance yet, but I'm confident that he will because he's such a great guy. I think in America, we're just preconditioned to getting 
getting things for free or asking for special favors and that sort of thing. Okay, so what do you think I learned on this deal? Stop giving away all the profit, right? So since doing this deal, I've changed my model to where the purchase price that the client buys it from me on the tail end is the greater of, we'll call it 5%, or the increase in market value from the time we bought it until the time they buy it from me. And again, I tell the clients, hey, would you rather make half of something or all of nothing? Although you might say this was a really bad deal for me and a waste of my time, I was able to help this great family probably double or triple their net worth and they've got affordable housing forever. And it makes me really feel good to help people like that. So I mentioned I also ended up buying house number 36. We're actually finishing a renovation here after the previous tenants moved out after living there a year. I'll be having a video on that very soon. What was neat about house number 36 was that I thought it felt a little big after I bought it and I had Terry measure the square footage on the property. What we realized was that the MLS actually had just the upstairs and they didn't include the finished basement. So if I measure the square footage of that basement times the average square foot of the property sold in the area, it's something like 50 or $75,000 more that that house may be worth. Even though I made hardly any money on this deal, it helped me to find that other property which I think I'll do very well on. I also met Gary and James who were the realtor and broker on that deal and we've become friends since then and like I said they encouraged me to get my license and to actually work with them at a very discounted rate with no monthly fee. This way I could save on the 3% transactions on the buy and sell side, use those with my lease purchase deals, list some properties of mine or friends and families and so I'm excited about this new chapter of becoming a realtor and I look forward to sharing some of that with you along my journey. If you happen to have seen the green Lamborghini with Cheryl on my social media. That was actually James's Lambo. So he must be doing something right, right? These guys are car lovers. They have so many exotic cars. It's crazy. So as a bonus, I figure I can put some of these cars on my channel so I can compete with my inspiration to do this channel, Graham Stephan, who's also a car connoisseur. If you happen to know what kind of Lamborghini this is, put a comment below and let me know. Oh, and Graham, if you're watching this video by chance, give us a shout out on your channel. Everything you touch turns to gold, man. I love your channel. Stay tuned for my next video on house number 36 renovation as we finish it and get it rented. Then we're going to start the renovation of our newest property, house number 41. I just closed on that last week. Oh, and a quick update on the house we've been building since two Junes ago. Our builder thinks that we are within the 60-day lock period. I'm waiting on a couple things before I do make that rate lock. And on my other loan where I'm pulling out a million of equity to buy four more properties this year, the appraiser is currently going to my properties and working on those appraisals. So more to come on those couple of things. Thank you again for your support of the channel. Hope you have a great week and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, it would really help the channel if you would click the like button. I hope you have a great week and I'll see you next time. Oh, and by the way, although I'm a licensed CPA and I have three business degrees, I'm just a guy on YouTube. So be sure to contact your professionals before making any investment decisions. Thank you so much and I'll see you next week. IdentityGuard.com is now offering my subscribers a 33% discount on their services. See the link in the show notes below.